안녕하십니까 한국언론진흥재단 저널리즘 지원팀장 양승혜입니다. 지금부터 한국언론진흥재단과 미국 동서센터에서 공동으로 주최하는 코로나19와 한미, 한미 언론 co-hosted by KPF and East West Center. Uh, the theme of today's forum is viral news media and the coronavirus pandemic. We, ha we are connected uh, with Hawaii, Washington, D.C., San Francisco. This is basically a video conferencing. Also, we are going to be uh, streamed live on YouTube. Our simultaneous interpretation services into Korean and English, both available on YouTube. So YouTube viewers, you can choose the language. And you can also receive the translation via the translation receiver in the conference channel one for Korean, channel two for English. Now I'd like to hand over to uh, President Min Byung Wook of the Korea Press Foundation for the introductory remarks. Good morning. I am Byung Wook Min, Chairman of Korea Press Con uh, Foundation. I would like to extend my grat gratitude to President Richard uh, Brisekete of East West Center, as well as Mr. Joshua Benton, Director of Neiman Journalism Lab, Mr. Alan Miller, Founder and CEO of News Literacy Project, and last not but, le but least, uh, Professor Junhee Jung and Dr. Seon Lee. Also, special thanks goes out to the members of the media from Korea and the U.S. for taking the time out in such a challenging time to participate as discussant. The coronavirus outbreak has shaken the world down and our lives have changed tremendously. The world seems to have been taken over by this virus and the situation is likely to be continued for quite some time press is in the center of all this. There are virtuous function of press, but there is also misuse and control of information, issues of distortion and discrimination, which already has surfaced. Sometimes transparent disclosure of information ends up in human rights debate. Also, intertwined with issues of survival, the issue seems to be in struggle even with how we can lead democratic life. Today's forum is a meaningful place where we will be sharing and discussing how Korea and the U.S. is responding to this dilemma in light of the COVID-19 outbreak and the role that media should play. In closing, I would like to thank our audience who are here present today in the hall and all the viewers joining us via live YouTube channel. And we will continue to create these forums where we can discuss about important issues in our society. Thank you. So I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Richard Boylstecker from the East West Center for the, con uh, the welcoming remarks. Uh, greetings to you all from Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, appreciate on short notice you all being have an opportunity to join this seminar. Wherever we live, and, uh, not just where we live, but where our friends and families are, we're all facing a very serious pandemic, as we all know. And one of the most important things in that kind of situation is to stay well informed. And this uh, webinar today is a, is a distinct uh, opportunity to be informed by good friends of ours from the East West Center and in Korea who are, and elsewhere who are really paying a, a great deal of professional attention to this situation. So on behalf of the East West Center and all my colleagues, I congratulate you all for your attentiveness and taking time for this webinar and wish you all safety and a healthy future. And may this webinar help bring it about. Thank you. From now on, we are going to start today's forum. Uh, first, uh, let me introduce our host, uh, Youngju Kim, Miss Youngju Kim from the Korea Press Foundation. Uh, greetings to you all. I'm going to be your host for today's forum. Uh, I am Youngju Kim. 
Corona virus, COVID-19, is giving us very challenging and also exhausting time as well. It's causing a lot of panic and fear, uh, but there is also an avalanche of information on, on COVID-19, which is causing a lot of confusion. We are calling this infodemics. Today, we are going to talk about pandemic infodemics and uh, the role that the media can play in the midst of this. We have two Korean speakers and uh, three Korean discussants uh, present in the conference hall now. From the U.S. side, we have two speakers and two discussants joining us online. Due to the current social distancing campaign, we uh, cannot have too many guest uh, attendees, but still we have a few uh, attendees here. And I welcome all our viewers from online. We have uh, four presentations uh, prepared. After that, we are going to have a panel discussion, five minutes per panelist. And then we are going to have overall uh, discussion as well. And uh, YouTube viewers may be able to participate as well. Uh, I'd like to introduce each speaker and discussant uh, as they uh, as it becomes their turn to talk. So, our first speaker is going to be Mr. Jung Jae-hee from Hanyang University. So he's going to talk about uh, news coverage of COVID-19 and infodemics. Professor Chung uh, studied uh, in UK, Goldsmith uh, University, and uh, also he is now uh, very well known and uh, frequently invited a guest on uh, broadcasting programs in Korea these days. So please uh, keep your presentation to 15 minutes. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Chun Hee Chang. As introduced, my presentation today is on information. Information is critical in such a pandemic situation. But when you look at information that is being distributed, this some of the information is not helpful in combating this pandemic situation. As a result, we're not just contaminating information, but we're also seeing some emotional contagion, which is not helpful to our survival. So, so we're starting from that definition of problem, and we come across many different types of media. We have traditional media, and we have social media like SNS. So through various media channels, the traditional media needs to have certain lead in helping people come out of this situation, but rather than providing accurate and helpful information, sometimes there are information that is just disseminated, which is causing uh, some infodemics. So that is the essence of my talk. But what I want to start off with is that we are seeing very interesting reality or interesting situation. So we're seeing a lot of production of news and news articles. But there's also increased consumption of movies and films, not in the theaters, but many people are self-isolated and they're working from home. So they use a lot of, uh, they use VOD and they view a lot of VOD at home. So they, for instance, Contagion or Fever, which is a Korean movie, is about, is, is a movie about uh, contagious disease. And they're viewing a lot of these types of films. And we're also seeing a lot of special air of this type of movies in terrestrial TVs. My question was that in such a disastrous uh, times, why are people watching this kind of sad and tragic movies? And I was not able to understand the emotion behind in such viewership, but when I interviewed a few people around me, I was able to uh, find out some things. And people, uh, by view viewing these movies, they were able to understand what would happen and how this would end in the end. So they copy and paste reality, or they copy and paste this movie into their realities to have a feel for what might unfold. News is about fact. 
and use talks about descriptive reality and they talk about what the world would be. That's the basic function of news. But films and dramas not just deal with the facts, but they also deal with what may be plausible. And they capture what may be possible in the real world. And that's what t films and TV drama is. So news and current affairs is about information, but films and drama could also be a source of information. But in such a pandemic situation, what we are discovering is that news and current affairs is increasing. And the kind of emotion we are seeing is that we are seeing hatred, uh, nervousness, fear, and anxiety. And in the early days of pandemic, the press didn't understand what this was about, and also the government couldn't understand what this would entail. So there was this uh, sense of anxiety uh, from both sides. And when you watch this movie, there are certain things that you can get. Under the framework of negativity, there is a start and end. The co and cause is also explained, and they also cover the kind of pain that someone might go through. So it's well summarized and analyzed, and you are able to get some understanding of what might happen. But in the movie, the contagion ends in the end, and they can get a sense of what might await us at the end of this tunnel, and they get a sense of relief. Will the reality end like this movie's? It's yet to be known, but when you look at news and current affairs, it's quite different information that you can get from these films and dramas. So in media, you're seeing this flush of fear come in. And this is the brain of reptiles. This is what we see from evolution. So you see the positive effect of trying to gather information. But when you go into the center of the brain, you get a lot of emotional results. So this brain of reptile make us to react immediately to outside. And when fear is there, the reaction becomes bigger. But evolution is a great achievement, especially for animals and mammals. When you detect threat, the way you respond is you either avoid or you attack. But this is based on terror, so you immediately react based on terror. And you evolve based on your instinct to survival. But then you see this uh, cortex. So when you evolve outside of cortex of your brain, you also need to look at a different evolution on a so social basis. So when we say we are social existence, it means that we are survival does not our survival is not achieved based on instinct, but our survival is based on group action. So when you experience fear, of course we have individualized reaction. And through acquiring information and when you interpret information we try to have group reaction. So there's this two different realm that is at work. If media is a social function, media has this positive effect of giving you surveillance so you can understand what kind of threat is around you and the kind of threat that may exist in our society. And another positive effect is it facilitates problem solving for people. However, there is also equal amount of adverse effect, and one that is most important to understand is stimulus, which is a threshold shift. Because if you have series of stimulus, one that crosses out one after the other, it will continue on this uh, adverse viral. One thing that we prohibited uh, is we didn't want to exaggerate realities and we didn't want to use exaggerated words. That was the principle. But if you look at this word, uh, the media started using this word penetrated 
extensively, as well as raging, as well as panicking. So this can describe reality, but this does not somewhat 100% uh, coincide with what reality might be. And the second thing I want to mention is that uh, it nurtures and fosters selfishness. If you look at behavioral psychology, when you feel terror and fear, it translates into action because you need to survive. But if there is other things than fear, and when you make judgment based on information, people start then looking for more information, information after information. So are we encouraging people to find more information, or are we encouraging people to be selfish, whether we intended it or not? So we need to look back on this, And but when you look at uh, panic buying in other markets, and in Korea we experience the lack of masks in the Korea market, and there has been some individual reaction to how to secure masks. This is a result of fostering uh, selfishness. This helps in individual survival, but this does not help in group survival. And we talk about panic, but panic could also lead to collapse of our society. And will terror end at the individual level? It could be contagious, and when there's contagion of terror, and fortunately we are not seeing that in Korea, but we're seeing that in other markets, but it could also lead to contagion of terror. And in 2018, in Nature uh, Journal, Dr. Heidi Larson said this, and I think this resonates with us at this point in time. What epidemiologists say is that the major outbreak is something that we live with nowadays. And as we see in the news, these outbreaks do not kill us all, but this has always existed in the evolution of human nature. And this kind of uh, contagious disease exists. And here the problem will not be lack of preventive technology, such as vaccines, but the problem is misinformation. And misinformation will spread like a virus, and it will become a threat to global public health. And Dr. Larson says that this is the bigger problem. So we may say that uh, this code is saying that news is the problem uh, because this is coming from an epidemiologist, but that's not all there is to it. It's not just a problem of lack of technology, but there's also this problem of fear at play. So we talk about fake news extensively, and we have different tiers of information. As we can see in this chart, we have about three different types of information. Uh, when we say information, there is uh, facts. But then when you look at problematic information, information does have some facts involved. These different types of uh, misinformation or disinformation has some facts involved. But there is some intent to harm or there's malicious facts that is involved. And there's also falseness, as well as intent to harm. So when you look at based on this different axis, uh, we can come up with three different tiers of information. One is misinformation. This could be done intentionally by mistake, but there's also malinformation at the other extreme of the information. So this is not a lie, but this is malicious. So it could be attacking a minority, for instance. And if some person's um, personal emails or uh, information is shared, that could be a threat. And also there's disinformation in the middle. So during war, you release diff wrong information to shake the other enemy. So you, you kind of mix information and malinformation in disinformation uh, to create a, a conspiracy. The problem 
I think the biggest problem lies with uh, the disinformation. Malinformation could be blocked legally, and misinformation uh, could be categorized as innocent. But disinformation is an information that is made to create problems, and it ends up in a rather sensitive situation. But can we overcome this through uh, ethical code or legal frameworks? It is no, we, it is very important that we we adjust this information. So, and I call that re-information, not just the information that is being circulated at the very beginning of time, we have to uh, have counter argument for this misinformation and disinformation and malinformation. This information is very well targeted, so we need to reverse that with uh, clear fact-based information. So if you can provide that fact, and if you don't have that fact, it will be very difficult to set off this disinformation. And we also need to attach some emotion to it so that we can effectively uh, set off this type of disinformation from disseminating. And that could be one role that media can play. Uh, here are some analysis. We looked at the uh, Corona-19 mentioned as keyword in the internet and SNS. In the early days, it surged, and then we went through uh, the stabilization period, and with the Sinchanji outbreak, we see the surge again, and it did go down moderately, and it went up whenever there is group uh, infection. So whenever there's an increased mention, you can see some spikes happening here and there. Next analysis is coming from our authorities, and this is the infection trajectory of COVID-19 in Korea. So the accumulated confirmed cases uh, is going up, and what we see in the left side is the number of release from isolation. And in the middle, what we see is number of people in treatment. And when you combine these two graph, you see something interesting. I didn't calculate the correlation, but when you look at the number of treatment and the uh, number of mention, uh, it, the graph actually coincides. I don't know whether this is scientifically explainable, but when you look at the COVID-9 mention as well as number of uh, people in treatment, it somewhat is in, uh, in line. So the numbers uh, or the graphs seem to be in sync with each other. And this is a graph comparing MERS with Corona-19. As you can see, this graph has different peak. For MERS, what we see is that uh, the outbreak uh, came from Samsung Hospital, which is uh, the care facility. And once we were able to control there, we see moderate decline afterward. In Korea, however, when we first saw the first confirmed case, it did went up. And when you look at these different small peaks leading up to the high peaks, uh, we, you see a lot of um, surprising facts. There is debate over uh, why we need to block people coming in from China. And these peaks showed different turns whenever uh, the numbers increased. And these peaks nowadays are created based on political debate nowadays. In MERS, we see a lot of negative emotion. But in Corona, surprisingly, we see a high level of positive emotion as well. So how is this emotion, positive emotions and negative emotion, related? Media and social media uh, is somewhat, diff somewhat similar, but there's uh, slight differences. We see a little bit, little bit less of uh, positivity in media and higher negativity in media compared to SNS or social media. Uh, the positive emotions are similar, but the media has a rather passive emotions compared to SNS. When you look at uh, the media's negative emotion, it's quite aggressive. There is a lot of language about damage and insecurity and terror. And in SNS, there is a lot of defensive words that is being discussed, such as being cautious and being fearful and being concerned.
So in essence, although it's anxiety or whether it's concern, it's about protecting themselves. But in media, a lot of the emotion was about creating terror and anxiety. When you look at words that is being mentioned, when you look at the crisis situation, you can see that less positivity in media and more negativity compared to social media. And when it comes to crisis, social media had higher positivity. And in media, we see a lot of um, negativity being nurtured. When you look at a different time period, it is confirmed again time after time. Social media has a lot of neutral emotions and also higher positive emotions. And when you compare these different emotional landscape, when you look at the word and when you look at the word and search words such as Corona 19 and crisis, media need to have more neutral emotions, but you can see that there's higher negativity and lower positivity compared to social media. Of course, this does not include YouTube, so the result may be somewhat different as a result of different search results. But sometimes people think that SNS is somewhat confusing and media is objective, but that is actually not the case when you look at these different emotional search cases. This is something that we need to uh, look out for and solve for. Why is this happening? You can also refer to the 2019 Harkup and O'Neill's research. Uh, it says that news value in news media in terms of priorities, bad news, surprise, amusement, and following the report and power elites. But the news values in social media value more on amusement and surprises and bad news. So media seems to focus more on negativity and linking that to political power. But when you look at social media, they look at uh, entertainment or amusement and at the end they link this back to their life uh, ending in relevance so the news that is being shared they focus more on relevance to their lives so this is somewhat in line with what I have anal analyzed in the previous charts so media is creating some negative emotions and linking that to power or government, whereas social media is less focused on bad news and trying to interpret the situation relevant to the people involved. Uh, let me give you some examples. These are series of reporting by Chungang Daily newspapers, and I believe this shows the politicization and discord making very well. So they're creating this political conflict out of uh, Wuhan people, uh, Koreans arriving from Wuhan. I don't know whether this is a great information. And they're stimul uh, there's uh, also stimulating emotion by saying that evacuating Koreans in Wuhan to the heart of a uh, highly populated city, why should, should it be us? It, it's quite emotional. And also, they create controversy on posting of Wuhan Koreans saying that fattening food and especially cold rice that I'm fed up with. It's a quote from Wuhan, uh, Korean, uh, Wuhan uh, people arriving from Wuhan, and this creates somewhat debate. And this picture is irrelevant to the situation and somewhat irresponsible. Uh, we've seen a similar reporting of such. This is from Herald Economy. And when they visited Chinatown, there is serious uh, hygienic issues that there is spitting on the road and wearing of no facial mask. And then it was revised again to say that there's a um, panic buying of facial mask for reselling purposes. So they're targeting minority communities, uh, saying that this community is not hygienic, and this community is trying to resell masks. 
So what we see here is that we see the issue of oversimplification and disinformation that mongers hatred. When you look at situation in Korea, it seems that it's quite well under control and the media is coming back or returning to the normal state. And I think that is due to a good reinformation of sources. I think uh, this, some of the uh, influence was coming from outside, and the aggravating global condition and increase of foreign media coverage on Korea is actually helping. And we see objective uh, perspective coming from overseas press, and a lot of press from the overseas covering Korea, and looking at Korea in a more objective way, so that we can have more fact-checking in Korea. And moreover, when you look at the Korea authorities, Authorities, as uh, we see in the dashboard here, uh, we see transparent disclosure of information. And that gave us a uh, source, good source of reinformation, preventing disinformation. And we shouldn't just view social media as uh, with a negative view, but rather we need to be responsible in overcoming this disinformation to come up with great reinformation. With that, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you. Yes, Professor Chung uh, talked about uh, the negative role or mechanism where the media can actually propagate uh, negative information, including false information, uh, disinformation, more, in, uh, more information as well, and how these information can be also corrected through reinformation. And uh, yes, at the early stage of the corona spread, we had a lot of uh, panic invoking information being spread in Korea. And also there is some disinformation as well, uh, not only false, but also intended to cause harm. This, that was the type of information that we also saw as well. Uh, but then again, uh, we also had a uh, re-information as well. So Professor Zhang gave us a very good uh, uh, snapshot of the situation as well. And we changed the order of uh, speakers a little bit. Uh, Dr. Li uh, is going to speak now. And uh, she's joined our foundation about 100 days ago. Uh, this is her first official and public uh, presentation since joining the foundation. She's going to talk about how the Korean people are consuming and using information related with COVID-19. And Dr. Lee, can you please limit your presentation to about 20 minutes as well? Uh, hello, uh, as uh, introduced, I am uh, Dr. Lee so Eun from the Korea Press Foundation. I want to talk about how Korean people are using and perceiving information on COVID-19. Uh, information usage, why is it important? Because Corona is now a global pandemic and it's now leading to infodemic. So uh, when there is a high uh, opacity of information, false information is spreading like the virus itself, which is causing many negative effects among people. So Korean people are receiving, uh, so we wanted to see if the Korean people are actually receiving false information from the media and what's people's perception of the accuracy or falsity of the information via the media as well. So I would uh, look at uh, that topic in uh, uh, four categories, uh, largely speaking. One, how people are using information from the media. And second, how they uh, perceive the relationship among the media. And how is the current information or media usage is different from the normal times. 
third, uh, people's usage of COVID-19 information, is it, uh, does it have any relevancy or correlation with the social trust? And lastly, I want to talk about some implications and suggestions in light of the current media landscape and media usage uh, trends as well. The part one, uh, these parts, I had uh, help uh, from my colleague at the foundation, and it is also published in our foundation publication as well. Uh, so this is how we conducted the survey. And during this period, as you can see, uh, the confirmed cases uh, rose from 7,200 to 7,600. And uh, day 11, WHO uh, declared that this is a global pandemic. So the situation was getting worse at the time. So this is the uh, time uh, when we conducted this survey. So please keep that in mind as the context for the survey uh, questionnaire. And now second part. So uh, Korean people are now using various sources to check uh, information. We wanted to see how much information they receive. So some people answered, I receive a lot of information, moderate amount of information, little amount of information. And which channel, for example, terrestrial TV or cable TV or social media. So we also looked at and you can see the response rates as well. And sometimes people also receive information via the website of the local government significantly above 50%. What was your primary information source? Number one was terrestrial uh, TV uh, followed by cable TV. And also, we wanted to see if there's any difference between age groups. So depending on the age group, as you can see here, across all age groups, uh, terrestrial TV and uh, web search portal sites received a high response rate. But among people in their 20s, many people answered that conversation with their uh, uh, friends is a uh, main source of information as well. And also we saw the discrepancy in the information source as well. If you look at the right hand side, we looked at what is the primary information source per age group. People in their 60s, terrestrial TV, cable TV, and then the next age group, uh, TV, newspapers. But people in their 20s, web portals, uh, social media, and cable TV. So uh, among the 20s, uh, social media, and among people in their 60s, uh, newspapers uh, uh, were selected as a main source of information. And we looked at their perception, their assessment of their chosen media, whether they think uh, they receive uh, accurate information, helpful information, in-depth information. And we looked at how much uh, response was positive to that kind of question, and then we got the average values of the responses as well. So as you can see here, the media, uh, the terrestrial media and cable TV, uh, government website received a high level of trust, it seems, and also followed by, uh, and then if you look at the social media, including uh, blogs and uh, online cafes, uh, they have lower level of trust from consumers. And also here we can note uh, that for source of reliable information and accurate information, people go to a government website. And, and also people have positive information, uh, positive perception of terrestrial TV channels as well. And uh, we also see uh, the dif discrepancy among age groups in terms of the assessment of the credibility of the information source. So in pe people in their 20s and 30s, uh, they value the government website very highly. 
and uh, people in their 30s and 40s, terrestrial TV were selected and then uh, followed by portal news and uh, media website. And uh, next, uh, we wanted to see what is people's experience about false information and whether they can identify false information. So for that, we uh, presented three completely false information, verified as false information, and one accurate information. And we asked our respondents to pick out what is uh, false or accurate information. And then and uh, we, this is the result. So uh, actually, high percentage of people uh, were a uh, about seventy percent of people uh, accurately identified all three false information, and also people but but answer that yes, I've experienced the false information, and uh, here somehow female respondent uh, shows a higher rate of answering yes, and terrestrial TV and cable TV, uh, they uh, receive a higher level of credibility. And social media, uh, like blog and social media, they were identified or perceived as a main source of a false information. And whether the Korean society is responding to the COVID-19 crisis, uh, many people said that I'm doing my best in their answer. And also, uh, uh, 54% of the respondents said that the confirmed patients are doing their part well. That was actually the lowest ratio of a positive answer. Uh, but also overall, people said that uh, the governments are doing well, medical professionals are doing well. And also 85% of people answered that I'm doing my best to do uh, personal, to observe the personal hygiene rules and to uh, get access information on COVID-19. Now I'd like to go into more details about how media is used for COVID-19 information. So earlier, we saw the overall picture of how people are using each information source for what kind of information and what has been their experience so far. And now we wanted to look at some relationships between different media outlets. And as Professor Chung mentioned earlier, uh, it is likely that the more information you receive, the more actively you're using the information or the more information you're actually using. And also, we asked which uh, information source are you depending on for the COVID-19 information? Portal news. News media websites were number one information source. And is it your usual number one media uh, source? Or is it different from your your uh, normal uh, normally preferred uh, media outlet? So there were some uh, differences between uh, your chosen media at this time and your chosen media or information source in normal time. So we were able to see some uh, change or shift. Uh, as you can see here, and also the local government website turned out to be more actively used by Korean people, which was uh, totally unexpected for me. So we wanted to see why they are using government uh, websites. Is it because they see this as an alternative source of information as opposed to the uh, news media? And then they, uh, the respondents answered that uh, where the, for example, the more positive they view the government's handling of the situation, they're more likely to go to the government website uh, to get the information. And also, I want to, so that was kind of my assumption. My only assumption is that if people do not trust other media, then they will go to government website as an alternative source of information. But then my assumption turned out to be wrong. Uh, when people receive information from the news media, then they want to see more information. So they want to be better informed. So as an additional source of information, they go to government website. 
So that's what we found. And、uh, we wanted to see people's experience about false information as well. Is there any discrepancy depending on the、uh, information source, etc.? So here,、uh, we didn't find anything、uh, conclusive,、uh, anything statistically significant. Uh, but I guess it's because in this COVID-19 situation,、uh, people are、uh, people's usage of information itself is very out of the norm. So that's why I think we didn't get any statistically significant conclusion. Now, part three: What is the social impact of using COVID-19 information, and also social trust as well? Here, the older you are, and the less you trust. The government response to COVID-19, and also the more you use information on from the internet, it turns out that the less、uh, trust you have towards the society, the less trust within the society. That's the overall conclusion of this section of the survey. So. People are using TV and media a lot.、Uh, that、uh, I think that doesn't directly translate into people's trust level of the society. That's what we were able to see. As、uh, Professor Jung mentioned, somehow Korean people have more negative assessment, negative impression of the traditional media. Personally, I think maybe that's due to the initial stage of the outbreak. The Korean media、uh, concentrated on broadcasting negative information about. Uh, Covid nineteen. Now implications and suggestions. So people depend highly on uh, uh, publicly credible media channels、uh, when they want to get information on Covid nineteen, as opposed to social media. So of course,、uh, there was an existing trend that people are using social media more as a source of information. But during this Covid nineteen crisis, people are turning to existing media, traditional media, for accurate information of Covid nineteen information. And also in terms of propagating accurate information on Covid nineteen, the traditional media is playing an important role. In people's mind, and Korean people have high level of interest in COVID-19. So people try to stay well informed on this issue. Hence, more active usage of media and information source. And overall, people are well able to identify false information,、uh, as we were able to see through this survey so far. And also, as Professor Jung. Mentioned as well, re-information was helpful as well. So, given this kind of situation, we need to use diverse information source or、uh, choose more appropriate、uh, information source. We also asked whether the Uh, media is doing well. Is doing its part well in this crisis, and、uh, quite surprisingly, people said、uh, positively. Uh, this was surprising for me because usually, when we、uh, have survey about people's level of trust towards the traditional media, in usual time,、uh, Korea ranks very low in that kind of global survey. Korean people do not trust the traditional media a、uh, lot, but this time around. People use TV or traditional media as a main source of accurate information on COVID-19. So. And、uh, there is、uh, the tendency of over、uh, covering the COVID-19 situation excessively, and they can have negative、uh, effect. So I looked at the. 
media coverage volume of COVID-19, it was about 0.7 million uh, articles or coverage instances, and that's quite a lot. So I personally, it made me wonder what is the appropriate uh, volume of media coverage of this issue. And also, we wanted to see this, uh, and also, we so. Uh, how people think about the factors uh, or what people desire to see from the media. When we were conducting this survey, the Shincheonji, the cult uh, that was uh, the epicenter of the corona spread at the early stage, we thought people would talk about that a lot. But no, actually people uh, were expecting more accurate coverage and accurate information from the media. And also, people answer that even if it takes longer, we are uh, uh, we prefer to receive accurate information. So they were asking the media to be patient to get the accurate information to report, even if it takes time. So people uh, view that or people are actually demanding more accurate information, even if it is uh, taking time. So we it, and in this kind of crisis, we were able to see that the traditional media, the main four media outlets, are playing an important role in the way people receive information and consume information and perceive information. So during this crisis, uh, definitely the existing media has an important role to play. So I guess uh, we can uh, continue to mull over this theme and even uh, for the post-COVID-19 crisis as well. Thank you. We have carried out an um, online survey at Korea Press Foundation and based on that, Dr. Lee has made a presentation. The usage of information by people is actually happening more, uh, actually happening wisely than we have anticipated. The usage of the municipal government website is increasing. It's because uh, the confirmed cases and uh, the information about where these patients have visited is actually shared on the municipal government site as well as through the text messages. So they're actually visiting these website to find information and uh, the accuracy and level of trust is actually very high. Also, when you look at legacy media during a disaster situation, uh, the territorial broadcasting stations have critical role to play in such a situation. And we also need to support this uh, through uh, the use of newspaper media as well. And that's something that we need to strengthen. The third presentation is coming from the US. We have with us a director of the Neiman Journalism Lab at Harvard University uh, by Joshua Benton. Uh, we don't have a PowerPoint presentation that we're going to project. So uh, please listen in to his voice. He is also a journalist before he was with the Neiman Journalism Lab, and he has extensive list of awards that he has received while he was journalist. He actually is a founder of the Neiman Journalism Lab as well. And thanks to his contribution, there's a continued research on journalism through Neiman Lab. The title of his talk is A Nearly Perfect Weapon, How COVID-19 and the Public Health Response Are Hurting Publishers and Journalists. Um, Joshua Benton, you also have 20 minutes for your presentation. With that, Mike is all yours. Terrific. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. I appreciate, I appreciate it very much. much. Um, yeah, I, I thought uh, it would, as a bit of a change of pace, I thought I would talk about what is really the most pressing part of the problem here in the United States, specifically uh, within the context of the media, obviously, there are much more pressing problems. Within the context of the media, the problem is financial. There is an unusual set of circumstances going on that because of the coronavirus uh, pandemic and because of the incredible interest that has been created 
in news about the pandemic. News organizations are seeing audiences bigger than they've ever seen. They're literally seeing uh, records broken uh, day after day, week after week. However, at the same time, they're seeing the fundamental anchors of their business model washing away from, from underneath them. And uh, it's, a, it's a difficult point in what has been an ongoing crisis in American media, the un ongoing financialization of what uh, what had previously been a, uh, a much more responsibly run industry, the rise of hedge funds and private equity firms who are taking ownership of more and more of America's newspapers, and in particular local news. Um, you know, the coronavirus epidemic is fundamentally a local story. It's, uh, you know, if you are in Arkansas, if you're in Utah, if you're in Louisiana, my home state you want to know what's going on right around you and there's some incredible empathy and love going towards the local news organizations but unfortunately it's happening at a time when financially things are well so just to start off uh the fundamental problem uh for news organizations is that the the shutdown of most public life has cratered the advertising revenue that most american and news organizations uh, are unusually reliant on of course, advertising is an important factor in the media everywhere. In the United States, for a variety of historical reasons, our newspapers have been unusually reliant on advertising revenue as opposed to circulation or reader revenue. That uh, that has meant that as local news organizations have been reliant on local stores, local restaurants, other local advertisers, the fact that these uh, local uh, advertisers are closed, are having their own financial problems, has meant that many have seen drops, sudden drops in advertising revenue of 30 to 50 percent. In some cases, it's been reported more than 60 percent. Um, and that has led to an enormous amount of, uh, of dismay, which has led to cutbacks, layoffs, uh, furloughs for reporters and other employees who are they're told to not come to work for a week or so and not be paid during that time. And in some cases on the extreme already, we've seen the closure of a number of news organizations simply driven by the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, when this was first arriving in the United States, we, we, we thought there would be four major ways in which the pandemic would have a financial impact on the sustainability of the news industry here. The first one, this is in roughly an increasing order of importance. The first was events and events can event cancellations. Um, one of the first things to, to go in when the pandemic uh, started to spread here was conferences, large events, the South by Southwest conference and others. Um, many uh, news organizations in an attempt to diversify their revenue streams in the last five or six years or so have tried to expand into having a larger event business. Uh, in some cases, it can be five or 10 percent of their overall revenue having events within their local community, using their power as a convening force to gather together uh, the, the, their readers in a, in a productive way. That, of course, has been uh, thoroughly shot in the, in the time that's happened then. But for the most part, that's a relatively small part of the revenue a pie, so it hasn't been a, a huge of an issue. Next up, I would say the next biggest issue is home delivery. Uh, in the United States, again, more more so than in other countries, our newspapers are very reliant on home delivery. Single copy sales are a smaller portion of our overall uh, circulation. And home delivery is, of course, a, a physical delivery process. Many news, uh, news or newspapers have found that the people who deliver the newspapers for them have either, in the worst case, gotten ill themselves or they have uh, realized they need to find some other source of income because perhaps their their other uh, job may, may be in trouble. Uh, they also uh, are engaged in uh, some people having fear about the actual safety of newspaper delivery. Am I going to uh, you know, catch uh, COVID-19 by having a newspaper delivered to me by someone I don't know? Um, as lockdowns have grown more and more intense, uh, a lot of newspapers have found it very difficult just to deliver their newspaper, their product to their customers every day. Um, and this is part of the overall transportation disruption we've seen. Those two are, are still relatively small portions. The next biggest one is, is really important, the advertising the clients that, that I mentioned beforehand. Uh, we, we've seen this uh, at the largest levels of, of media, uh, digital media. Google and Facebook, it's been estimated, will be losing about 10% of their advertising revenue uh, for the uh, however long this, this period lasts. 
that's a, a significant uh, decline, although they, they're going to do just fine. Uh, we, we've seen in digital media uh, decreases in the range of about 38% by the latest national estimates. Uh, that, uh, and if you go to print advertising, it, it's gotten substantially greater. I, as a test, looked around at some major American newspapers uh, a few days ago to look at how many ads they were running in their print editions. The Philadelphia Inquirer, which is a, a storied newspaper, a very famous newspaper um, that has you know a, a great legacy, in their first section, the A section, uh, they ran zero ads. There were no ads in the entire entire first section. That's the sort of situation that, that folks are, are finding themselves in. You've seen it as well at the, in the national outlets like the New York Times, others who have been essentially winners in the transition to digital media. They warned not too long ago that they were facing up roughly 10% increase in advertising revenue that's what they were projecting. And while initially those projections were for perhaps a short period of time, the latest uh, idea is that it will basically you'll be seeing a 30 to 50 percent decrease for all of April, all of May, and a substantial part of June. Uh, of course, all of that is up to uh, how the process of, of uh, returning to normal life goes. But it's a big hit. And it's a big hit for a lot of news companies that were in a pretty difficult position to begin with. Uh, in some ways, what this transition has done is push news organizations faster along in a shift they've been trying to make in hesitating ways for the last few years to be less reliant on advertising, to be more reliant on their readers. Um, the rise in digital subscriptions that we've seen most, most spectacularly at the times, but uh, to a less degree at other local outlets, that is a direction um, that, uh, that they've been wanting to go into. They feel that it's a more stable route and that's becoming incredibly clear in the last the last few weeks. The biggest potential risk, though, frankly, is uh, recession risk. You know, I've been director of the Neiman Lab for uh, 11 years now, and throughout that time, I have found that um, uh, there's, there's been a, a regular drumbeat of saying, what's going to happen the next time that there's a recession? Well, the, the long uh, but underwhelming boom period that we've seen in the United States has pushed back that date year after year after year. And it's finally here. And it's a moment in which uh, a lot of news organizations are, are seeing their, their valuations disappear. The largest American newspaper company, uh, Gannett, uh, last August, it was valued at $1.4 billion. Um, as of this morning, uh, that valuation in its publicly traded stock had dropped to $88 million. Uh, it's a decline of 94% in the last eight months. Um, that's an extreme case, but we are seeing a uh, really fundamental shaking of the local news uh, system in the United States. Uh, and we'll have to see how, how far and how deep that recession is, and whether it's a, a V-shaped recession that, that people can bounce out of or not. One of the segments that's been most hardly, most uh, most hard hit by these changes has been the alternative weeklies. Um, alternative weeklies, um, you know, these are free newspapers uh, who rely on physical distribution in places like bars and restaurants, and subway stations, all the places that used to be very good uh, locations to greet a lot of people every day, but which increasingly are underpopulated. Um, one, one famous alternative weekly, The Stranger, which is in Seattle, Washington, uh, announced that it was going to have to stop printing and ask for donations from readers. They, their editor said 90% of our revenue, advertising, ticketing fees, and our own events is directly tied to people getting together in groups. The coronavirus situation has virtually eliminated this income all at once. Uh, a term that one editor of an alternative weekly used was total annihilation. That uh, this segment of the industry, which has been, impo been important for uh, a lot of local reporting over the years, was being fractured in a way that seemed quite frankly, very difficult to recover from. You've seen dozens and dozens of these news organizations uh, ask for donations from readers, suspend their print publication, uh, lay off large numbers of staff, and in a handful of cases, just shut down entirely. The impact is not quite as as uh, extreme, but is nonetheless significant for daily newspapers for the reasons that I, that I mentioned before. In addition, advertising uh, daily newspaper readers are, particularly in print, uh, substantially older 
than the average of the American population. They are a population that has been unusually uh, affected by, by coronavirus and that is also uh, unusually resistant uh, to transition to digital. So they've been facing a lot of pushback. Um, one thing that uh, many of them have, or a number of them have been forced to do is to stop being a daily newspaper. Most dramatically, the Tampa Bay Times in Florida, which is a, a very esteemed newspaper owned by the nonprofit Pointer, Pointer Institute, um, one that's produced a lot of great work and a lot of great reporters over the years, went from being a seven-day-a-week newspaper to a two-day-a-week newspaper. They say that this was temporary, but it seems likely that that won't be particularly temporary. As we go farther up uh, the chain, uh, in television, we've seen uh, a lesser impact, but we have seen layoffs and and, furlough, uh, and there's a broad concern that uh, that the, the damage that could come uh, is coming a little bit further down the road. What is this going to do in the future? Um, let's talk about a few of the possibilities there. Um, one thing that I think it's going to do, uh, unfortunately, is lead to a lot more consolidation in the news industry in the United States. Uh, we're, we're seeing significant uh, decreases in the ability of any one local news organization to build a sustainable uh, business model. Um, we've seen chains of newspapers and cor uh, corporate chains that have gotten larger than ever before. Uh, they are using that, that size to try and gain efficiencies. Cadet, which I mentioned earlier, uh, was looking to reduce $300 million in annual costs as of a few weeks ago as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, they have now increased that another 100 to 125 million. Uh, it seems likely that uh, they may not be a, a standalone company in, uh, in the very near future. Not too long ago, we had five major national newspaper chains in the United States. Um, it's very possible that by the end of this year, we might have two or maybe one. Uh, in addition to that consolidation, we do have questions about the events business. Is it going to come back after uh, this pandemic? pandemic has, has taken its course. There are some questions about the degree to which the fact that news organizations are getting very comfortable with their staff working at home, working in remote locations. Other companies are in the same boat. Will there be as much demand for physical meeting? Will there be a, a rebound uh, from, from the decline that we're seeing now in that business? It's unclear. Uh, O'Reilly, one of the largest uh, book publishers, technical book publishers in the United States, has for many years run a very profitable and very uh, ambitious events program with uh, dozens and dozens of conferences attended by many thousands of, of people each. And uh, a few weeks ago, they announced that they were not just pausing those events the way that everyone has been. They said they're not just pausing it, they're going to get out of the business entirely. They felt that after the coronavirus pandemic has passed, they are not optimistic that anything like the, the events business that existed before was going to come back. Back, that there'd be more of a pull for more desire for virtual events, the companies would be less willing to spend to send their employees off to uh, gain knowledge and, and networking at these sorts of events. You've also seen a number of news organizations that have used the, the moment to try and provide a sampling opportunity for potential readers and potential subscribers. Because the demand for news is so very high, um, lots of news organizations have, that have paywalls have taken them down specifically for their coronavirus-related coverage. That has meant that a flood of new readers uh, who are not perhaps incredibly familiar with or connected with that news brand have been consuming uh, these, these at, a, at a very large rate. And that has led to, even though those uh, paywalled articles are no longer paywalled, has led to real spikes in subscription. One of the most remarkable was that the Atlantic Magazine, which uh, put up a metered paywall last fall and uh, frankly had an an amazing number for March. I was really shocked that it uh, that it was the number that I that they were saying it was. Thirty six thousand new paying subscribers purely as a result of their coronavirus coverage, which uh, has been very strong and has been very valued by lots of readers. You've also seen uh, examples like the, the New York Times, which uh, earlier this week announced that they were going to be giving free access to all of their journalism to high school students for the next three months, um, in part because of the distance 
location has been caused by schools closing, but also, frankly, as an opportunity to get young people hooked on, onto news. I do think that in the future, you know, if we look ahead, look back at this moment in three or five years, we'll see that the desire of young people to be connected to the news was meaningfully impacted by this event, hopefully in ways that can be useful to the, to the industry and to journalism. But I, I think in some ways the, the, the landmark element of, of what we've seen is the willingness of news organizations to ask their readers directly for help. Uh, public media uh, radio stations and television stations in the United States have always been willing to ask their viewers and their listeners for, for help to have fund drives and membership drives that lead to donations from, from listeners. Uh, that's been a, a very successful part of their business model. Um, but they are nonprofit. They are public media. Uh, there's been a question about well, how far that can extend into other traditionally for-profit and frankly traditionally very profitable forms of media, which is what most local newspapers and local, local television stations have been. But we've seen a number of news organizations for the first time simply saying, give us money. We, we need you to understand the value we provide in your city and your community. And we ask you to uh, not just appreciate us uh, for the work that we do, but to give us money even without the reward of extra content that you're going to receive or extra membership benefits. Um, just today, uh, Vox.com, uh, a very large and very popular uh, site that covers politics and, and national affairs, but is, which is a venture capital funded company that, you know, not too long ago was valued at nearly a billion dollars. It is, it is not a, a shrinking non-profit, non-profit news organization somewhere. Vox.com said today that they were seeking donations from readers. Um, in some ways, that's jarring to see uh, a enormous uh, news organization that has that has been funded quite enormously by venture capital funds to be putting that, their hat out and asking asking for money. But I really think we're shifting to a dynamic where the impulse that people have who do care about news, who do want to have a connection with, with the news, they are seeing it more in the vein of the public service than they would have seen uh, 20 years ago, where the public service may have been a part of their connection to the outlet, but it was also the ads that they saw as a sport scores they couldn't get anywhere else and the broader package the broader bundle of content that a newspaper could provide increasingly the the, the specific civic value of a newspaper is coming to the foreground the both publishers are, are making that a bigger part of their messaging readers are appreciating that uh, ever more and to the extent that there is any hope in this scenario, which has, quite frankly, been incredibly damaging to the, the news media here, it is, the, the hope would be at the idea that perhaps that greater connection, that incredible burst of readership, the clear import of, of what journalists are doing on the ground could lead to the foundation of a new revenue model based on readers paying directly that could be more sustainable, more stable, and perhaps allow for local to continue in a meaningful way. Um, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you for that presentation. This is actually a very important issue for all of us. After Corona 19, uh, COVID 19, uh, the financials of the media will be difficult. And in Korean society, we're expect expecting economic slowdown and financial difficulties. And the media will suffer even further. And whether it's government or whether it's civic society, we need to come up with some measures to overcome. And whether it's a donation from our readers, we need to come up with some uh, solution to overcome these difficulties. One thing that was encouraging uh, from his talk was that uh, we see increased consumption from uh, the children and teenagers who are staying at home to read more news. So we need to really uh, continue on that great news and continue to have um, more consumption for this segment. A lot of the revenue of the newspaper is actually dependent on large events. And now, of course, we're seeing cancellation of these large events. But even after the corona outbreak, it seems that it may not recover. 
the CEO of this uh, conference organizer, uh, said to me that the recent conferences all have been canceled. But then it seems that KPF and East West Center made a great uh, gesture of hosting this conference. In October, we have Journalism Festival, which is prepared in fall. It's a big event, which is held like a festival, and we want to encourage journalists uh, in this area, but currently we are concerned on whether we should do it. So we have, we're currently developing plan A, B, C. And now we have uh, our last presentation remaining. The last presenter is Mr. Alan Miller, a founder and CEO of News Literacy Project. And he has worked in LA Times for over 20 years. And afterward, he is carrying out news literacy uh, training and education for our youth. And he is very active globally in terms of carrying out news literacy education. Today's presentation is about news literacy and coronavirus. And I believe that um, Alan will be talking about a lot of implication from this uh, virus outbreak. With that, Mike is all yours. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you this evening. Um, having difficulty advancing my slides. Uh, you bear with me. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to start my talk by uh, just touching upon the complex information landscape against which the coronavirus pandemic is playing out. Uh, we have more credible and valuable information available to us literally at our fingertips than at any time in human history, but it's competing for our attention against exponentially more information that is intended to uh, exploit us, mislead us, and divide us, information that is not credible. This is what happens every minute on the internet uh, in terms of that landscape. A study of Twitter by MIT found that false stories in this environment travel much faster, farther, and penetrate more deeply than fact-based news accounts. There are many motives for creating this kind of misinformation, a profit, partisan political advantage, or ideology to create mischief or to divide Americans or divide other countries and undermine trust in democracy. There is no barrier to entry for those who would create this misinformation and very little financial cost and virtually little penalty when they're found out. There are a number of different kinds of bad actors in this environment. Uh, these are examples of a few of them who are extremely active uh, on the internet. These forces all come into play whenever there's a major breaking news story. Um, these are fertile grounds for misinformation. Uh, and the reason is that there's enormous public interest uh, and curiosity. These stories tend to provoke a high emotional response. Misinformation is really designed to prey on emotion which overrides sort of our rational thinking. There is an initial lack of verified information as journalists scramble to find the facts, and there may also be misreporting at that time. And the bad actors move in quickly uh, and often help set the, the terms for the narrative. The coronavirus represents a perfect storm in this context. And this choke quote from Charlie Wurzel of the New York Times summarizes it well. Is a breaking story of enormous global impact. It has a huge emotional component, sparking enormous amounts of fear and anxiety and grief. There's a tremendous amount of uncertainty surrounding, even among the experts. We've seen a flood of, co of conflicting and unverified information, even from official sources. And science, which plays such a critical role here, is taking a great deal, has to take time by its very nature uh, to catch up with events. 
I'm going to talk about a few examples of the kinds of uh, misinformation that we've seen. Um, one of them is in the origins uh, of the virus. Uh, this is this is prompted sort of a hotbed of conspiracy theories around where it started, uh, including from the Chinese army uh, by Bill Gates. Uh, Anti-vaccination forces have suggested that it was uh, started to uh, get people to get vaccines and and even uh, there was been a conspiracy theory that was started by the Obama administration and sold to the Chinese. Chinese government in turn has told the public there that it was the U.S. Army that brought the coronavirus to Wuhan. Of course, there is no evidence for any of this. There have been a slew of false reports relating to prevention and treatment, which potentially endangers people's lives. This has included such things as inhaling hot air from a hairdryer, or eating bananas, where you see another example here. There's been also a lot of uncertainty around the wearing of masks, and again, uh, uh, conflicting uh, information uh, in the U.S. about whether or not to do so. Uh, this is one uh, uh, piece of information that is utterly false. There's also been uh, a number of uh, viral rumors uh, about uh, what can treat uh, the virus. Um, this is one of them uh, involving uh, drinking water to uh, flush the virus down to one's stomach. It's obviously, there's no evidence for that. Um, there have been a number of others on that score um, uh, that uh, have no, no basis in fact. There's also been uh, misinformation about the degree of the seriousness of the pandemic. Uh, and this is one example where conspiracy theorists really galvanized following a powerful March 25th report in the New York Times about Elmhurst Hospital in Queens, which has been particularly hard hit. And the report provided a first-hand account and video from inside the hospital where 13 people had died the day before from COVID-19. Three days later, a Twitter user posted with this hashtag, film your hospital, and asked, can this become a thing? Hours later, a far-right uh, uh, talk show host took video from outside of uh, Brooklyn Hospital and said it appeared there was not much happening there. That was viewed by, by 1.3 million viewed 1.3 million times. This started a trend on Twitter where people were posting photos outside hospitals where it appeared nothing was happening, suggesting the crisis was overplayed despite widely reported growing number of cases of, of the virus and of deaths, particularly in New York. These are examples. Uh, these these individuals uh, were motivated by a range of things, apparently some who maybe genuinely felt that the, the virus was overplayed by the media for partisan purposes, and others who simply were, were pushing conspiracy theories uh, that it was a hoax or, or a false flag. One of the things that's made it more challenging to get verified information is that for journalists, uh, getting to the front lines of the virus has been challenging which is the front lines, of course, being inside hospitals due to concerns about privacy and health. Internationally, there have also been efforts by governments from the Middle East, Latin America, Russia, and elsewhere who tried to shape the coverage to avoid criticism or dissemination of information that authorities deem harmful. This has involved such things as fines and investigations of journalists and expulsion of foreign correspondents. As I mentioned, these are the kinds of first draft which tracks misinformation uh, had, has indicated there were these six different kinds uh, during the crisis. In a prescient book uh, Charles Seif wrote in 2014 called Virtual Reality, he said that the way misinformation spreads is analogous to the way that epidemiologists assess the spread of diseases. Their common qualities are transmissibility, persistence, and connectedness. COVID-19 is a case study in this for the disease as well as for misinformation. The internet has made everything instantly transmissible from person to person at great speeds across all borders and boundaries. Everything lives on it forever and social media connects us constantly and globally. Seif wrote, bad information 
radiation is a disease that affects us all, a disease that has become unbelievably potent thanks to the digital revolution. The World Health Organization has called the overabundance of information about COVID-19 an infodemic that makes it challenging to find trustworthy sources of information. In fact, the infodemic has much in common with the pandemic itself. You can see the, the qualities of both pandemic and infodemic here, which are consistent here throughout. For the pandemic, there is no vaccine yet available. This is the one difference. For the infodemic, there is a vaccine, which I will touch on in a moment. Not surprised Surprisingly, uh, the, the misinformation threat has led to enormous uh, distrust and uncertainty about the media and information generally. This is true in the United States and worldwide in terms of the challenge of determining credible information from rumors and falsehoods. This is sowing confusion and worry globally. You might notice on the on to the right uh, on the section here about false information or fake news being a, used as a weapon that South Korea is one of the countries with the highest level of concern on that front. So, in some, misinformation is as great a threat to the public life of democracies as the coronavirus is to their public health. And this is the reason that we need to do everything we can to give facts a fighting chance. We have a particular responsibility to the next generation, which is inheriting this information ecosystem created by another generation that didn't fully understand how it would unfold. Um, this should be a digital golden age, as I said, with more valuable and credible information early available than ever before, but it's being turned against us by this tsunami of misinformation. Therefore, we have an obligation to ensure that students today know how to navigate this fraught landscape in a way that can unite us around verifiable, agreed upon facts. This is the mission of the News Literacy Project, the educational nonprofit that I started in 2008 after speaking to 175 sixth graders at my daughter's middle school about what I did as a journalist and why it mattered. Our mission is to empower educators to teach students to understand, uh, to be able to discern credible information and have the tools to become active and engaged participants in their communities and their country. We want to see news literacy edu 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 uh, embedded in the American educational experience as a vital life skill, and we're beginning to do work internationally as well. This is what news literacy means. It's the ability to determine what is credible and what is not, to use the standards of fact-based journalism to decide what to trust, share, and act on, and then to interact with news and information to promote engaged participation in civic life. We do this a number of ways. We have a, a virtual classroom that I'll touch on further in a moment. We have a weekly newsletter called The SIF, which takes that week's viral rumors, conspiracy theories, and hoaxes and turns them into teachable lessons uh, with prompts and links. And we also have an app called Informable, which is a news literacy game for all ages that assesses and builds news literacy skills. You can find a lot of our resources at newslit.org. I mentioned Checkology. This is a cutting-edge uh, online platform with highly engaging real-world lessons led by journalists from reputable outlets uh, that give students a foundation in news literacy skills. We launched it uh, in 2016. We've now had over 25,000 educators registered to use it in every state in the U.S. and 112 countries around the world because misinformation knows no national boundaries uh, with over 150,000 students. Students. We've also been doing international consulting with a number of nonprofits around the world, and we've created a global playbook of lessons learned and best practices and resources that we can share with those who are introducing news literacy in South Korea or elsewhere or looking to expand its use. As I mentioned, misinformation is itself a global pandemic, um, and I think that it is something that threatens uh, the civic life of countries around the world. And to combat it, we need collectively to have a new ethos of personal responsibility about the news and other information that we trust and that we share. So what can we do collectively to push back 
against this toxic tide. We can track, look for misinformation, follow the independent fact checkers and fact streams to check out anything that we see that may be dubious. We can sharpen our digital verification skills. Um, this may mean learning how to do reverse image searching or or lateral searching for different sources of information that we encounter online. Um, we can comment on or debunk anything that we see as misinformation so that we can call it out and, and push back on behalf of facts. And then we can help friends and family members understand the stakes and spread the word so that they too will become uh, part of this uh, fight for facts. And then finally, uh, we can flood the zone with credible information uh, that we can share what we know is reliable and credible uh, so that it is in a, able to compete against this tsunami of misinformation uh, that threatens to, to mislead and, and even harm, particularly at a time uh, like the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Ellen discussed about the importance of news literacy. Pandemic do not, does not have vaccine, but infodemic does, and the vaccine is and can be found in news literacy. Our foundation carries out various projects in news literacy, and I believe his talk is very helpful in care also and very helpful in also, also helpful in what we do in our foundation. So we have concluded all our presentation, and we will now move on to discussion. We have um, two journalists connected from the U.S. and three. Uh, from Korea. So first, I would like to invite Chang Eun Koo, a reporter from Kyunghyang Shinmun, to speak. And the second speaker would be uh, Vanessa Hua from San Francisco Chronicle. And the third discussant will be uh, Kimira Bichira Kim from KBS Journalist Talk Show. And then followed by Amy Britton. And last but not least, we want to invite Yumi Park from JTBC. And uh, Chang Eun Koo has served in journalist, journalism for 25 years. And he, she is a senior reporter reporting for Kyungyang Shimun. You have five minutes. Good morning. My name is Chang Eun Koo. We are experiencing and covering COVID-19 for a couple of months. And I believe uh, journalists all over the world is facing the same uh, challenge. It seems that we're facing one unified challenge, and that's a very rare case. But we're seeing extensive isolation, and it's becoming a new normal. So we cannot approach the front line, and that's a very unique situation, something that we experience for the first time. There are many things to be covered for this contagious disease, and this is a highly communicable disease. But because we, are, we don't have access to the front line, when you look at the press coverage, most of it uh, rely on numbers and numbers and dashboard. So it seems that uh, the voices from the front line is covered less. And I am a journalist who goes out uh, to the front line, and I want to look back on the kind of limitation and issues. We see a lot of press coverage on uh, the numbers as well as uh, what is happening. And currently, we're seeing number being reported as if it's a game score, uh, as if saying that the number surpassed search threshold. And there's lack of analysis. And that is because there's um, limited ability to carry out these analysis. And the press is unable to enhance quality behind the kind of analysis that needs to be covered for the public. Uh, from the government response side, you probably feel this too, but there is a lot of criticism that is influenced by political stance, and it's bringing out conflict and bringing out hatred. As Professor Chung rightfully mentioned, that we're seeing uh, this kind of things that is 
that has happened. And there's positive message coming out from social media. And once that happens on the social media, then the media seems to follow the footstep of what is positively happening on the social media. Uh, Professor Chung mentioned emotional contagion. Uh, in covering for disaster and contagious disease, this is something that we have to uh, be mindful of. We have to think about this emotional contagion. And when I looked at uh, Dr. Lee's uh, presentation, you also mentioned that there's a lot of negative emotion covered by media, and I fully agree with that. There are some political drive behind it, but I myself, when I reflect upon this, uh, I, it seems that not only political intention is at play, but it seems that uh, we we feel obligated to be criticizing all the time, and we always fall into that custom of criticizing for the sake of criticizing, and I think that is at play here. And as a result, reinformation re and correction of misinformation is now not done by the traditional media, but by social media. And I fully agree that the existing media is not uh, catching up to what is required at times. Dr. Lee talked about what is requested from our readers and viewers. And when I look at the survey, a lot of people look for and demand for information that is helpful for them. Helpful for them. They they welcome outlooks and and criticism, but also they need information that is helpful and useful for them, and I was able to reconfirm that needs. And although it takes time, uh, readers and viewers want accurate information, although it takes time. But one thing I would like to also mention is that the survey was carried out mid-March, so the time has passed, and it will be great to see an uh, updated version of the survey. As a journalist in this area, uh, it breaks my heart to hear Joshua's uh, talk, all the events being canceled and financial difficulty faced by uh, newspapers or uh, press. This is not limited to the U.S. It's for all the media across the world. So it would be great if we can capture this demand when this demand is exploding. So can we convert this crisis into a new opportunity? I don't know. I'm tapping into new segment and new consumers. This is something we need to do, but we are failing at it. And also, Alan, I have a question for Alan, actually. So in the U.S., when I look at the news coming out in the U.S., there are these bad actors who intentionally disseminate misinformation. And because there is a lack of media or news literacy, they consume this. But how should I say this? In the U.S., it seems that uh, even the president or the high-level officials disseminate misinformation. It's not just in the U.S., but in other countries as well. And in order to correct that information, media needs to play a role. Uh, but it seems that media is not playing that role to the best of its capacity. So they listen to news that they want to listen to and believe what they want to believe in. In such a situation, you talked about what media consumer can do. But other than consumers, what can media do to correct such a situation? What kind of approach can media take to correct such a situation? And that's my question for Alan. Good. Thank you very much for your pain, uh, point. So, yes, uh, the Korean media have been uh, reporting the crisis as if they're reporting a uh, sporting event. Yes, and also we have all the habits of just simply criticizing what the government is doing. Uh, so that was a really good 
point. And also, she asked a question to Mr. Mueller. So if you can answer the question later, that will be great. And now our uh, panelist is Amy, uh, Vanessa Hua, excuse me, reporter Vanessa Hua from San Francisco Chronicle. conversation. Um, and it's been fascinating to hear these presentations, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, I thought it, it would be good, you know, obviously what Joshua brought up is, was of high interest um, to all of us, um, particularly just, and I was, it, I was struck by his thought that, you know, the civic value of newspapers is coming to the foreground now, and that readers are appreciating that, um, and they're, they're feeling a sense of connection. Um, and so it's interesting, it was uh, just sort of made public today that the Hearst Corporation, which owns the Chronicle has told its newsrooms um, that there will be no layoffs, no furloughs, and no pay cuts, um, and that further they're going to be giving a bonus to some employees, um, or to all employees. And um, sort of the news analysis is that Hearst has decided that uh, having these comprehensive local reports about the pandemic and about the forthcoming recession are an opportunity to sort of showcase that this is an essential public service, and this hopefully can be build audiences. Um, and, and, and I think it does help that Hearst is a private company. So as opposed to some of these other chains that have to sort of, or, you know, uh, chains that are that are owned by hedge funds, for example, that may just have a different view of what, what should be profitable or not. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's interesting, sort of as a case study, um, there was a decision, you know, should the Chronicle keep printing? And should there still be home delivery? And in fact, it, it has. And um, newspapers are now, you know, I see that, you know, there's not many ads. I do see ads about, oh, we are hiring for delivery drivers. Um, so, I mean, I think there's, in, amid all this chaos, um, I've heard from readers, um, just online or contacting me, you know, just that there is a, a newspaper, a daily newspaper in particular, one that shows up on your doorstep does provide this um, sense of one tiny bit of normalcy, one re re uh, reminder of the world that was and is helping convene people for the world that, that can be. Um, and I think, uh, you know, there's the Chronicles had like certain very excellent incremental coverage um, because, you know, speaking about front lines, um, you know, dr local journalists in particular, we're not just covering the pandemic, we're we're living in it. And so it's sort of like, I, I've found just the paper has become essential reading. I'm finding out things about school closures in the paper before our superintendent is even announcing it. It's, you know, it's that kind of story that's breaking that quickly. Um, and I think one of the payoffs has been is that it's viewed uh, as a trusted news source. And, you know, as a result, uh, tips have come in because people want to push back against what they might view as you know, the government not being forthcoming. And the Chronicle just this past week wrote the story about the aircraft carrier Theodore Roosevelt. Um, and its captain had sent an email to, you know, to various Navy personnel begging for help um, because of an outbreak of coronavirus on the ship. Um, the captain ended up getting relieved of his duties um, after the Chronicle story came out. The acting Naval Secretary Thomas Modley, uh, you know, blasted him um, in a speech and then Modley ended up resigning him, um, himself. So, uh, you know, and that came in as a result of the fact of, you know, uh, Put pedal to the metal, uh, local reporting, and also just being viewed as a, a credible place, you know, for this story to come out. Um, you know, I've been contacted by cruise ship passengers begging for, um, mul multiple times begging for, for some sort of, you know, they're not getting help from their government officials or they're not getting help, um, they're not getting any answers and they're, they're turning to social media, they're turning to journalists in order to get um, their message out. Um, and in terms of just interesting cultural angles, of, uh, you know, there's this talk about the scaremongering, but I think there, 
you know, publications do have this opportunity not to gloss over things, but to have rooms for the things that are optimistic, that we can, that are signs of humanity coming together um, in the best ways. Um, let's see. And uh, so, you know, um, speaking to what Alan was uh, had brought up about how there's so many hoaxes out there and how uh, false information spreads more quickly, um, you know, I've, it's been interesting to see that people who normally don't fall for hoaxes, who would know to check onto Snopes, um, you know, because there has been a lack of a sort of cohesive national policy, I think that's why there's been sort of this rise in word of mouth or like, I know someone who knows someone because there's just been so much uncertainty about what what what's to happen. Um, and I thought it was interesting how Alan had said, like, part of it is just about flooding the zone, so to speak, with, with credible information so that it does begin to push back against the, the hoaxes. Um, so I see I'm coming up on my uh, the end of my time. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, and thanks for bringing us together tonight. Thank you for the discussion. As uh, Vanessa mentioned, uh, this is definitely a time of crisis, but there is also increasing demand on news. And as Joshua mentioned, we are seeing inflow of new uh, consumer segment coming in. So this could be leveraged as opportunity. And the role of media will become even more important after uh, COVID-19. Of course, good journalism requires investment. So like uh, Joshua mentioned, we need to overcome this crisis and media need to publish great journalism, and that's a challenge that we all face as we weather through these challenges. Our third discussant is from KBS. You probably are aware of the journalism talk show carried out in KBS, and Pichira Kim has uh, spoken about the issues of journalism in that talk show recently. As introduced, I am covering and monitoring many media, and, and we have a weekly program to cover various media in Korea. And during the corona situation, we have closely followed how Korean media has covered and broadcasted and reported on COVID-19. Many has already spoken about this, but whenever there was a contagious disease, uh, there has been some consistent pattern, and we're seeing that again, such as uh, exaggerated reporting and negative coverage of the situation. And but in this corona situation, we are also seeing infodemics and causing more confusion and leading to lack of trust from the public. And we're going. I'm going to briefly talk about what our show has analyzed recently. It, during the MERS or SARS situation in Korea, online and mobile news consumption was uh, rampant. And so one line of headline was really important for newspapers and publishers to grab attention of its consumers. It's not different this time. Many people are using media more and more, and therefore media is competing for one line of headline to grab readers' attentions, and that has led to many misinformation. Uh, one telco released a wrong information that one of the medical care provider died, and it was broadcasted globally as a breaking news, creating fear, and we ended up having this misinformation broadcasted uh, because we had this fierce competition to be fast and to be the first one to broadcast. What we're seeing in Korea is that a lot of people are talking about how we can respond better. And, and, and rather than talking about how we can respond better, uh, they're creating this vi they're trying to create this viral for the sake of covering COVID-19. 
Um, as my fellow journalist mentioned, uh, we have tendency and DNA of criticizing and have, having a critical view. So if it's not a broadcast of facts, we look at politi politicians' uh, wordings. But when you look at the number of coverage, there is lack of coverage on what to do and how to respond in such a pandemic situation. Our readers and our people want to know how to respond in such a crisis situation. And media has been slow in covering that. And that has kind of declined our trust from the public. And amid such situation, what was interesting to see is that from the very early days of COVID-19, uh, the Center for Disease Prevention and Disease Control is releasing numbers every day, so number of confirmed cases and regional distribution is being broadcasted. And also, the government is doing fact check on misinformation. So government is actually playing the role of the media. And they're stopping and setting off wrong information on or uh, misinformation from disseminating. And the reason a survey carried out by a Public Broadcasting Institute is that 91% of respondents said that uh, CDC is responding very well. And for media, however, the positive review was only 40% range. So what this implies is that people use and consume media more due to COVID-19, but there's lack of trust or diminishing trust from the public, and they trust government more. And also, uh, the activities of experts in social media is not helping too. So the media is redistributing information that is coming uh, from a wrong source. And when they look at this news, uh, what they want to do is that individuals, they do fact checking on their own by visiting website or Facebook or Twitter of these experts. So, and they're also looking at uh, overseas or foreign reporters' uh, uh, footsteps so that they try they understand what is really happening in the front line and they call, try to look at what this uh, foreign media's cover such as the drive through systems in Korea to understand whether we're doing well or not so we're doing um, this press coverage based on our customs so there's a lot of demand and requests coming um, for our media but they uh, is, uh, compared to what is expected from us, we're not actually delivering on what was requested from us, from our audience. We heard about Czechology from Alan, and maybe uh, press and media can gather together to create uh, such a platform like uh, Czechology. Making these solutions together, I believe, is something that we need to do, and we hope that this opportunity can serve us to do that. Thank you. You have analyzed a lot of things already, and you have raised issues of media. And not just the issues of media, but uh, you also mentioned that the role of media should be elevated to providing solutions. And on Czechology, I mean, Alan introduced about Czechology, but for media, we also need news literacy for journalists as well. I guess that's what you're, uh, what that's where you're coming from. Now I would like to invite Amy. And she's coming from Washington uh, Post. She has covered extensively uh, in um, Ebola as well as a gun shooting event. In 2016, uh, Washington Post received a Pulitzer Award, and she was a part of that team. Please uh, keep your comment to five minutes. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I think that early on in this reporting on the pandemic, one of the challenges is that there were not widespread images that could be conveyed to, to the public to show the severity of this pandemic and what we were facing. In other disaster situations, such as a hurricane, for instance, you can see images of the water rising, of the wind gusts picking up, and you can kind of sense the severity of what is coming. In a pandemic, uh, we're often not allowed to see those scenes um, of people dying in hospital beds, of people struggling to breathe. So I think that early on, a lot of people in the United States were very dismissive of the ultimate threat. Um, with that being said, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the early challenges of reporting on this topic. Um, I'm going to start with some of the, the difficult situations and move into some signs of optimism and hope because I'm a uh, I'm an eternal optimist even in a pandemic. <laughs> so early on I would say that uh, like my co-panelists have said uh, one of the challenges was disinformation and uh, a need to to get information out to the public very quickly. Uh, we have an old saying in journalism uh, trust but verify and that is more important than ever especially in a situation where the news cycle is like a fire hydrant of non-stop information that's changing uh, by the day, by the hour, sometimes by the minute. So when you're dealing with a situation like that, it can be difficult, especially as a long-term uh, reporter like myself, someone who typically does projects that take months or even up to a year at some point, it can be difficult to kind of find your bearings and to try to imagine what are going to be the stories that we want to read about or hear about uh, a month from now or two months from now or at the end of this year when we're looking back on the situation that we're currently in and that's typically the types of stories that we look for are stories that can bring accountability investigative angles to uh to stories that are breaking new stories of the uh, so at the beginning uh it was very difficult to see beyond uh just the breaking news headlines that were coming across screens every, every day also our team uh like like all teams across America and the world was disrupted. You know, we normally work alongside each other in the newsroom. A lot of our communication takes place face to face with our colleagues. A lot of our communication with our sources uh, happens over dinner or conversations or face to face interactions to kind of build that trust. All of that was stripped away uh, in a matter of a day, pretty much, when we were told that we would not be back in the office for what will likely be a very long time. So uh, that's been a challenge uh, for an industry of communicators. Sometimes people in newsrooms can have uh, a surprisingly large amount of difficulty actually communicating with each other. So I think that that's been a transition that is getting a little bit smoother at the moment, but it has been difficult for our newsroom to pivot to, uh, to working completely remotely. Um, so the sourcing was difficult. Uh, another thing that was difficult early on is that the data has been really, really bad. Uh, as an investigative reporter, we rely on data to, to guide us to stories, to pinpoint what issues we should be digging into uh, more deeply. And the data on this issue uh, from the beginning was way off. I mean, we didn't have accurate testing data because the testing was so greatly botched in the United States. Uh, not only that, but there is uh, woefully inadequate data concerning our healthcare systems. In this uh, the top researchers in the United States can only tell you uh, for certain uh, the number of uh, critical care resources like ICU beds and ventilators that existed uh, several years ago because there's such a lag in reporting uh, that type of data. Uh, sometimes it's voluntary and it's not even mandatory to report. Also, in the United States, the hospital systems here kind of function as individuals rather than a collective effort. Uh, so what you're seeing right
right now is that uh, there are consequences to that. For instance, hospitals uh, may not be used to sharing information about their supplies or their current cases, and now uh, you kind of have to share that information in order to survive when you're dealing with cases from state to state across the country. With all that being said, uh, I will say that there are signs of success and there are signs that are giving me hope in this moment as we're moving forward and covering this uh, the first thing that I wanted to say is that um, although advertising is down at the Washington Post, our publisher announced it was either today or yesterday. My sense of time is very, very off during this pandemic. Uh, but our publisher announced that subscriptions are at a record high right now at the Washington Post. So that means that readers are consuming this content and valuing it at levels that are truly historic for our publication. And when you think about it, we've had a major news story after major news story for for years now, especially during the Trump administration. And this is a newsroom that just came off of covering uh, a presidential impeachment scenario, which, uh, you know, at the beginning of the year, you could have thought that would have been the most uh, important story of the year. Perhaps the election would be the most important story of the year. So for readers to show that support through subscription, it means everything for our newsroom, not only for our financial viability, but for also the morale of staff, because we're seeing tangible evidence that readers are consuming this work and they value it enough to um, to pull out their pocketbooks and to actually pay for that content, especially in a time where a lot of the Americans are worried about their own financial stability moving forward. So that's something that we don't take lightly um, and we value it tremendously and it means a lot. Also, um, just on the final note, uh, I mentioned some of the challenges of, of working remotely and kind of moving uh, newsroom operations to that structure. I've seen tremendous empathy among colleagues and greater understanding and communication. Um, you know, these are people that uh, I, on a lot of days, I spend more time talking to them than I do uh, my own family and my own people in my household. So um, for those conversations to happen and for them to be meaningful and for an editor to check in and say, hey, how are you doing? And not just a, a passing reference, but actually be genuinely interested to know how that we're all holding up mentally, emotionally during the situation. It means a lot for keeping uh, morale up and allowing us to produce uh, high quality investigative journalism that we hope provides tremendous value for so, That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. So, uh, Amy Britton was our last panelist. So, if I can do a quick summary of that the importance of information sharing. Solidarity is also important. Solidarity is necessary. And also dramatic increase of the subscription. Uh, so even though it's not uh, giving, uh, even though we are suffering financially, how can we uh, have a more viable subscription model or how can we uh, continue with that in the future? And also the role of the medium. Uh, the media and also the format, the type of communication is going to change in the future. So what kind of implication is it going to have? And also uh, what should be the role of the media in the midst of these changes as well? So we've been talking for a long time and we have about 200 viewers uh, watching this forum via YouTube. We have viewers from various countries and now viewers are posting questions as well for example from Hawaii California Florida and Australia Singapore the Philippines even Papua New Guinea we have a viewer from Papua New Guinea as well and also we have uh, viewers literally across the world now and also we have uh, journalists participating in this room as well so we are going to have Q&A session soon. So we would like to take time to go through these questions first, and then we also like to introduce some comment. Uh, we have a comment from a bot. The issue of infant 
pandemic is happening because there's no transparent disclosure from the government side. I think this is something that was also mentioned from Amy's discussion as well. Ah, I am so sorry. I missed out on one discussant. I am so sorry. Yumi Park, we have one last discussant. Uh, from JTBC, we have reporter Yumi Park. JTBC is one of the most trusted broadcasting station in Korea, and many news consumers are also watching JTBC coverage. I'm sorry, that was my mistake. Please uh, understand. So with that, I would like to pass on the microphone over to Yumi. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Yumi Park from JTBC, and I am covering Corona-19. It's been 80 days since we had first confirmed cases. It seems that I my existence was uh, not uh, really strong enough, I guess, um, so I was left out. But anyway, I had to follow the statistics of um, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, but uh, nonetheless, I was here attending this um, conference, and it was very helpful. So I'm actually covering news from the front line, so I would like to briefly go through how news is covered in Korea. The media coverage for contagious disease is uh, rather difficult because uh, the approach is somewhat different from any ordinary uh, coverage. We have a guideline and rules regarding covering for contagious disease. But what I really faced in the front line is that although we cover uh, these different diseases, uh, there's also a conflicting situation based on uh, the philosophy as a or principle, the principle of journalists. We have to focus more on accuracy, and we have to manage different messages carefully. And we also mentioned about uh, the competition for speed. And we, we looked at it rather negatively, but uh, we sometimes try to differentiate our articles with other broadcasting stations. And one of that differentiator is speed. And we want our readers and viewers to actually see this news faster than others. So, so the speed is something that we cannot completely ignore. And that's one thing. And Amy also talked about working from home. But for us, uh, we have a briefing from Center for Disease Control in the morning and in the afternoon. Uh, before we had this isolation, uh, we were able to go and access the Center for Disease uh, conference room in Sejong City, and we were actually on site to cover for different nuances. But as we started doing social distancing, and we now have online conference, and what I do is I collect all the common questions and deliver it to the government authorities. So the questions are collected in advance. So the level of question on the kind of question that is posed to government is rather similar. But still, we follow the guideline from the government because we have lessons from MERS, and we don't want uh, media to cover misinformation, or we don't want wrong information to be reported. And I think the situation is the same for government. There is um, information asynchronous 
if we don't have access to the right information. And during the marriage situation, the government didn't even disclose the name of the hospital, and we were not able to confirm and validate the confirmed cases. So even the government announced the number of confirmed cases. We didn't trust government because we thought government is hiding number of confirmed uh, cases. But now government is very transparent, and we are therefore able to deliver such news uh, quickly to our viewers. And caution is also very important, and we ask about that in every briefing. So many say that we only cover number of confirmed cases in our news articles, but at some point, rather than number of confirmed cases, uh, the importance and weightings kind of shifted to other area, area, and I hope you can feel that when you go through our reports. And I wanted to mention something about uh, competing for break news. So there is about eight news agencies and 140 journalists going into Ministry of Health and in the uh, SNS uh, link, we have about 180 uh, journalists uh, in the distribution list. But in contagious disease coverage, we cannot make the headlines uh, provocative. So, so what we can do is that we have to be faster than the others, and we look at uh, different criticism and different angles, and we also try to give some alternative way forward to differentiate ourselves. But there's just so many. Not really give up on speed, because there's just so many journalists. And Professor Jong talked about how uh, we create conflict, and I have differing views, so I wanted to mention that. So when we differentiate, I mean, we want to have fastest breaking news, and we have that destiny, and it's our fate, actually. Uh, and I looked at uh, breaking news headlines that was covered before, and there was Korean uh, people coming from Wuhan, Wuhan, and many people were interested to know how they are moving and how they are arriving in Korea. So this isolation news coverage was covered by us, and it was a breaking news. And and without that coverage, it would have been very difficult for us to know what would happen. And also, uh, there was some community resistance when these uh, Wuhan uh, Koreans from Wuhan arrived uh, first in Korea. And I think delivering and covering uh, for what actually happened is, I believe, a role of a, a journalist. So we didn't have time to actually coordinate with the community people. People, and we try to air that as uh, it is without any delay, and we also covered the implication of doing that isolation. And also, there was a lot of uh, follow-up coverage from other news agencies, and it could have sounded rather provocative, but when you look at this uh, single breaking news, uh, what we try to do is we try to pinpoint uh, the, the problem of government decision-making process. And I believe it served as an opportunity to talk about how we should best do that uh, decision-making for public health. And we also uh, heard about different survey results from social media, and the result from social media and comparison with the traditional media is something uh, that was very interesting for me to learn. And as a, a frontline reporter, uh, it was actually uh, painful to learn that survey result. But there are certain social functions that uh, media should play, and enhancing quarantine, and reforming treatment and improving treatment for uh, critically ill patients is something uh, that we covered and we raised voice in, and government reflected that. 
And so we're thinking about uh, the criticism uh, that media need to play, do, and that's something that we'll continue to do to make systems better. Thank you for that. I apologize once again to Yumi. Many uh, people in the uh, Many people are participating through our YouTube, and I was very excited, so I forgot my role. And you talked about the dilemma between breaking news and the accurate news, and you also talked about what is actually happening in the front line. So we don't have uh, much time left. We have to conclude by noon, and we are seeing many questions coming up from YouTube channel. So first, I would like to ask our journalist on site uh, with, uh, on whether you have question or not. If you do have some question, I will be accommodating one or two questions from you here in the room. But um, Jung Eun Koo had a question uh, for Alan. So let's hear from Alan first and then move on to our floor discussion. Alan, are you there on the line? Okay. He, oh, yes, he's on with us. Yes. Uh. Allen, you can speak. Uh, Mr. Allen, you can speak. Mr. Allen, you can speak. Mr. Allen, we are not getting an audio feed of your voice at the moment, so uh, we will take a moment to... Uh, am, I, am I coming through now? All right. I started to say that I'm going to talk about the media writ large because the United States, I mean, there are all kinds of media. There are more, you know, straightforward news outlets that seek to provide an impartial uh, information for, um, upon which people can make up their own minds. There are certainly much more partisan outlets, particularly on cable news. There are all kinds of online publications and bloggers. And so there's, and then of course there's social media. So there's a very wide range. Having said that, um, and I think Amy actually very well described some of the challenges that the news media is facing here in the United States and covered by its nature is always going to be imperfect. But I do think that the, the news media in, in general has provided uh, an incredible amount of valuable information under extraordinarily difficult circumstances where there is, you know, a limit in some ways to getting at the heart of the story in the hospitals when there's been so much conflicting information coming out of official sources when the science and the data are scrambling to sort of catch up with the story. And when, frankly, there's so much misinformation out there uh, from the sources I talked about and online and even from the senior officials in the government, uh, that the media has done uh, in many ways a good job of debunking uh, when some of these things can literally be a matter of life and death. I also think that there's been an effort to have do real accountability journalism and to do investigative work on sort of what the upper levels of the government knew and when and, and around the testing and uh, the other issues about uh, social distancing, whether different states now, of course, are doing it at different points in time, uh, and to hold public officials accountable at a time when, when their decisions, you know, have such enormous consequences. I will say on the issue of trust, that what we've seen reflected with around the pandemic is what we see in general, which is that, you know, people tend to see their news through prisms of red and blue, a conservative and liberal, and so they tend to go to only outlets that they're going to believe and, and trust those and not those who contradict their point of view. So we've seen the same kind of sharp partisan divide around trust, which in this case, as in all cases, makes it very difficult to agree upon what the facts are. And here that becomes really consequential because so much of the success in fighting the pandemic rides on not just what government does, but what individuals do uh, in terms of trying to stem its spread.
답변 감사드리고요. 저희한테 질문 와 있는 먼저 시작을 해 볼게요. So let's begin with the Q&A session. So we will be accommodating question from the floor in a bit. So recently, uh, I mean, we, coronavirus started uh, from China, so there has been some hatred toward expressed toward uh, Asians. And there has been some media coverage on that. And we're also seeing violence against Asian. So do you believe that unbiased pr uh, press coverage is possible? So how can we have unbiased, um, non-discriminatory coverage uh, for this uh, pandemic outbreak? Anyone uh, who can answer for this? Josh, uh, would you be? Uh, Ready to answer this question? Uh, sure. uh, uh, I think this is a case where uh, there's a really big divide between the actions of mainstream media and a very thin slice of partisan conservative media. Um, and in a lot of ways, it's really less driven by media and more by political elites. So you've seen a lot of Republican members of Congress and other politicians uh, um, talk about the China virus or the Wuhan virus, and really trying to put it in a lens of, uh, of an anti-China message. Uh, from what I've seen, uh, once you exclude the extreme uh, right-wing organizations, uh, I think everyone else has done a pretty good job of maintaining the proper nomenclature and trying to uh, report it in a straightforward way. I will say that uh, I have seen a lot more of the reports of specific uh, violence against Asian Americans on social media than I have in mainstream media. So it's possible that the mainstream media could do more to, uh, to, to cover that, although I don't really have a good idea and I haven't seen a, uh, good evidence on the degree to which it, the scale is isolated incidents or something more, more systemic along the lines of what we saw in, with violence against Muslims after 9-11, after for example. Um, but I think the mainstream media has, has generally done a pretty good job on that front. Oh, could I say add to that? Um, I myself am Chinese American, daughter of Chinese immigrants. And, you know, I think something to consider is the sort of very long history of um, anti-Chinese sentiment that's been in this country. Um, the Chinese Exclusion Act, dating back to 18, um, you know, the 1800s for 61 years, you know, we were the, the Chinese were the first nationality uh, to be barred from, um, you know, most immigration from China was was uh, not allowed. And so for the longest time, Chinatowns were seen as places, as places like full of disease or full of illicit activity. Um, you see it sort of echoed in the whole wet market rhetoric that somehow Chinese are dirty and brought um, broad infectious disease to these shores. So what's happening is actually uh, not new. It's actually very familiar, I think, to Asian Americans. Um, but in terms of you know improving coverage, I think some of that speaks to um, diversity in coverage. Is you know who's in our newsrooms? Who under who has the language and cultural capabilities to recognize this? I mean, there are, for example, uh, you know, uh, very progressive. Of, uh, people who would say like, oh, are you really sure that this is a problem when in fact um, for many Asian Americans, they've, uh, myself included, have already seen an increase in sort of anything from dirty looks to a woman in New York uh, yesterday or the other day, acid was thrown into her face. Um, so. I think this is a real concern, um, and so it's a question is like how it can be addressed it has to be you know reflected in the news values of the different um, organizations. Yes, I think this time uh, really uh, extra hard work efforts from the media is called for. I'm, so, I'm a reporter uh, and I want to ask a question about North Korea media coverage of uh, Corona, uh, media coverage of North Korea COVID. North Korea, they're saying there's a no case of COVID-19. People are saying that's not credible. So in terms of the perspective of transparent information sharing, I'd like to ask for uh, our uh, speakers uh, take on North Korea's that kind of posture on media coverage on COVID and what is your, uh, so 
can can we have a volunteer among our uh, discussant to answer this question? Can we have a volunteer? Maybe Professor Chung? Okay? Yes. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Chung mentioned that it's up to the country's sovereignty. It's a matter of the country's sovereignty. So North Korea, how can, so if the question is how can we make North Korea uh, share their information with transparency? If that was the question, my answer would be impossible. But uh, I think your question is more about the general uh, ten, uh, tendency about North Korea, but not just North Korea. Uh, I guess uh, around the world, statistics are flawed. For example, China, Chinese statistics. Can we trust that wholeheartedly? I don't think so. And France as well, they also have some uh, wrong statistics going out as well. So when the statistics itself is not accurate, then sharing that statistics itself is kind of disseminating, disseminating false information. So that's one aspect. I'd like to share some questions posted on YouTube because I, th I guess that's coming from uh, uh, the consumers of the news media. How long will it take for the world to return to the normal state? Of course, the world is not the same and the uh, rebound may not be the same, but Going forward, uh, how do you see the world after the coronavirus and how should we respond to that? I guess that's coming from one of our citizens. And also, what kind of impact would coronavirus uh, would have on the Korean-American or Korean-U.S. relationship? I'm sorry, Korea-U.S.-China uh, relationship. And what kind of impact would it have in global uh, community and global relationship? I guess we don't have time to cover such a broad question. And we all uh, have different areas of expertise. So I would just uh, receive this question and remain at that. We only have eight minutes left. So I would like to use this time for our participants to have concluding remarks. We will start with Professor Jung because he raised his hand for the first time. I want to uh, add two more things. First, as uh, you have mentioned, uh, we understand the challenges you face in the front line, and that's something we have to keep. Uh, we have to consider. Of course, government cannot always be transparent, so we have to have that uh, cross-checking, and that cross-checking role should be played by the press. So. Therefore, we need a protocol to meet this special situation. But if the frontline coverage is difficult and challenging, um, and it's very difficult to check the fact, but we see explosion of news. If it was challenging, the number of news should have been limited, but we see explosion of news. Would those news be satisfying the government messages? No, because we have seen a lot of misinformation or bad information as well. And one hint uh, that I get from our journalists that uh, you said that you were pushed away. but And I think that's a conscious choice that the media should make. We have explosion of news, and you're competing for that seconds uh, for breaking news. But that's a choice for individual journalists to make. But in the end of the day, you have to think about the good it brings to the overall society. And I think that's a uh, very unusual and uh, unusual situation that has happened because of this um, COVID-19 situation. Alan talked about this, uh, this uh, information. Infodemic, and and he said infodemic has a vaccine, and that's a very positive and optimistic message. But my conclusion is somewhat different. Uh, but probably because we're coming from a different environment. But in Corona 19, uh, we don't have vaccine or treatment, and current inform 
pandemic, we see different types of virus strain for this infodemic today. So the cure and vaccine for all these different types of infodemics, uh, do we have all the cures and different treatment for all different infodemics? No. I think what we need to do is, I mean, what we see is we see debunking of this false news, but and once we avoid that, many people think that false news or misinformation will disappear once we take out debunking. But that's not all there is to it. You have to consider the psychology of these people. These people will accept whatever misinformation there is because they're willing to. So we need to give them dry and fact-based or descriptive information. I mean, re-information is about creating vaccines and treatment. Uh, Aristotle said that we need ethos, pathos, and logos. So in some, some cases, we need prescriptive treatment, but in some cases, we need effective emotional treatment. And in some cases, we need persuasive treatment uh, using ethos. So in order to create re-information, we need to go through that carefully engineered steps. But it's very difficult to persuade uh, those consumers of misinformation. Uh, there are a lot of people that swings extensively. And when you give them good information, that could be corrected. And there are people uh, called critics. And for the critics, you need logic plus facts. Only then they will be corrected. So we have different situations where people have different symptoms uh, in this infodemic outbreak. So we need to tailor our treatment and vaccine based on that different situation. And without that, it would be very difficult to re re difficult to correct this malinformation. In the interest of time, I'm sorry we have to conclude our session. So all year, I was sharing a few comments from YouTube. So I'd like to share additional comments from YouTube uh, to conclude today's forum. So one of the reasons for infodemics is because of the lack of accurate information and information itself. So the government uh, itself uh, sometimes uh, wait to release the information to check whether that is accurate. So uh, that is a reality sometimes. And also from the consumer side, because they lack a news literacy, they just receive and believe false information and also the news media, they should do their part. Uh, for example, they can maybe pull the resources to check the accuracy of the information. So I guess this is another way of saying promoting solidarity among news organizations. Uh, so in other words, I guess what we need uh, to overcome this crisis is the overall uh, collective action and solidarity among the government, the news media, and uh, citizens around the world. So I hope that that was the concluding spirit from this forum. Thank you very much for staying with us for many hours, particularly our participants from the US, our four speakers and discussions from the US. Thank you so much for joining us despite the opposite uh, time zone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.